Good evening, everyone. We want to welcome you in to a conversation that I'm having with Bill. I'm George. Hi, Bill. And we worked our way to uh, Genesis chapter 41. We're looking at the life of Joseph. And I best, probably the best way to describe the life of Joseph is two steps forward and three steps back. Uh, he's someone that uh, we read uh, is the favorite son of Jacob and Rachel. And uh, sometimes being the favorite isn't a good thing. Um, in his case, he's, he's a dreamer. God has given him these dreams, and he makes the mistake of sharing his dreams with his brothers. Well, and, it's, it's how he shares that dream with his brothers that first time when he's 17. He comes across so, as a 17-year-old, when he, and doesn't give God the credit, really, in there either. That's exactly right. And they sell him to prison to the uh, Ishmaelites. Um, but God is with him, and he ends up in Potiphar's house, and because of uh, God's favor, he... He rises up and gets promoted to being in charge of Potiphar's house. But it's in Potiphar's house that Potiphar's wife makes, uh, makes a move on him. And he sidesteps her and then falsely accuses him of making an advancement on her. And so because of that, he ends up in prison. Two steps forward, three steps back is the life of Joseph. Is that for George Strait's song? It ought to be if it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to think. I know I've heard that somewhere. Anyway, go ahead. Well, yeah, but, you know, so he ends up in prison. So what happens? What happens in prison? He's between these two? Yeah, he's between uh, uh, these two guys that are in prison, a cupbearer and a, uh, and a chef that are imprisoned. And they have dreams. Um, and apparently from what little bit I know about uh, uh, Egyptian history, cupbearers apparently, apparently, and chefs too, apparently, had some political connections. I mean, you know, the cupbearer mm -hmm. would, would taste, you know, the wine or whatever and make sure it wasn't poisoned. <laughs> what a job. <laughs> yeah, it's a great job. You, you know, you'd hope it was high paying. Um, and, but anyway, he interprets their dreams and um, uh, he basically... Works out good for one guy. Uh, works out good for one <laughs> guy. Chef. does not work out well at all for another one. So be careful when you ask someone to interpret your dreams. Mm. Yeah, um, because that's, sometimes that doesn't end well. It's better not to know the future, I think. Do you, do you dream? Do I dream? Mm-hmm. We all dream, George. I just don't remember my dreams. Yeah, there's, uh, there's nothing, been a few hey, here there's and there. nothing going on over here. <laughs> well, you don't have to I tell me dream. that. But uh, I've had like three dreams my whole life. Three dreams. That's about it. Really? You were one. You were one of them. By the way. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> but, but we've all been. At, those of us that are married have been in these circumstances where we have a spouse that dreams. <laughs> <laughs> no <comment. laughs> And uh, for whatever reason, she wakes up angry with you, and it's like, what did I do? <laughs> well, here's what you did. Well, I wasn't aware of that. But, but yeah, so, so, so he, he, he interprets these dreams, and uh, for the cupbearer, it turns out pretty well mm -hmm. in that uh, he interprets the dreams, and the cupbearer in three days would be restored to his position. And uh, he also, Joseph asked the cupbearer to remember him, mm -hmm. remember me, you know, and of course, he doesn't. And for two years, uh, you know, two years, you know, Joseph, again, languishes there in prison still. Yeah. Kind of begs the question, does anything good come out of suffering or waiting in suffering? Um, came across this quote from A.W. Tozer. Is it, um, it is doubtful, he says, whether God can bless a man greatly until he hurts him deeply. <clears throat> and uh, sometimes, you know, God does some of his deepest uh work and in us whenever we're waiting or whenever we're we're suffering um you know the genesis 39 begins i think in verse 2 where he says that uh that uh, the lord was with him when he was uh being promoted in potiphar's house and if that's true um then the lord is also with him while he is in prison waiting these two years yeah. And so um, we tend to think that God is only with us whenever everything, you know, everything is going well. But it could be that God does some of his uh, best work in us whenever we're having to wait, whenever we experience some suffering. And so, you know, what we believe is that in these uh, 24 months that uh, God's doing some of his best work. And a lot of times it's just those times when we have doubts and we question that we come to deeper understanding. Mm -hmm. and to a stronger faith. So yeah, there's a lot to be said for that too. 
Um, so kind of reminds us of what takes place in Job, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we want to look at Job 23 verses three through nine. Uh, Job, of course, lost everything he owned, including his health. He lost all 10 of his kids. Uh, and he says, beginning in verse three, if only I knew where to find him, if only I could go to his dwelling, or I would state my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I'd find out what he would answer me and consider what he would say to me. Would he vigorously oppose me? No, he'd not press charges against me. There the upright can establish their innocence before him, and there I would be delivered forever from my judge. But if I go to the east, he is not there. If I go to the west, I do not find him. When he is at work in the north, I do not see him. When he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. You know, he's kind of asking the question, where is God and what is he up to? Yep. Um, north, south, east, and west. If I could just sit down with God and just get him to answer all of my why questions, I think I'd be better off. You know, it's kind of what Job is asking here. Um, but I have really no idea what he's what he's up to. Mm -hmm. I don't feel his presence. And so, but there is a statement of faith that follows in verse 10, but he knows the way I take when he when he's tested me. I will come forth as gold, um, he says. My feet have closely followed his steps. Um, I have kept to his way without turning aside. I have not departed from the commands of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. And so, you know, Job is um, admitting that, you know, it's during these difficult times that God is, you know, he is, uh, he's forming gold here out of, out of this uh, circumstance here for, for him that um, uh, because of his attitude, because of his faith, that God is doing something good in spite of all the bad. Yeah, and so Joseph uh, has to wait. And uh, you know, he says, he tells, he interprets correctly, interprets this man's dream and he benefits from it. The cupbearer forgets about him, mm. you know? And uh, two years go by, of course, it reminds us of what uh, Abraham waiting for Isaac. Moses didn't leave Israel until he's 80. Noah waits 120 years for rain. Uh, Tom Petty, of course, saying that waiting is the hardest part. <laughs> so uh, you know, there's plenty of examples. Did you say Tom Petty? Uh, I said Tom Petty. Yeah, right. He's not in the Old Testament, but Tom Petty. Uh, <laughs> or uh, the New uh, Testament. Or the New Testament for that matter. <laughs> right. right. But it's during the waiting that uh, sometimes it seems meaningless, but God is shaping us for something significant. Are you good at waiting? Uh, that's a ridiculous question. <laughs> no, I'm not very good at waiting. You've helped me. I've helped yeah, you. Yeah, because I have to wait for you all the time. Really? Yes. Yeah. That's, that's I mean, how many basketball to... games have we have we waited for you to, you know, you're the last guy? <laughs> Most of the basketball games that we that we wait. Uh, what are you saying? Like, like the last guy chosen? No, 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 no. The last yeah. guy to show up in the gym. Oh, oh, oh. So, no, but none of us are good at but waiting. But it's worth the wait, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, okay. No, we're not good at waiting. Um, as I've gotten a little older, maybe a little bit better, but... Um, but something to think about here is um, <clears throat> maybe there's somebody out there that's thinking, man, my life is really horrible, you know, where I'm at right now. Right. And that's maybe what Joseph um, is kind of wrestling with. But, I mean, what is God going, to, what is God doing in you right now that is preparing you for two years from now? Um, it takes a lot of foresight and faith to, to think like that, but... You know, could it be that God is doing something in you right now that is preparing you for something that's 24 months away? And this is obviously what he's doing in, you know, in, Joseph's, in Joseph's life. Um, yeah, he's preparing him for something bigger. And how often, I mean, the older you get, the more you look back over your life, it's like, well, I didn't see that. I see it now that God was working, but I didn't see it then. Didn't see it then. No. So we're going to open up our Bible. So Genesis 41, um, this is kind of the turning point. Another turning point um, in Joseph's life. And it was just a day like any other day. Um, but uh, Pharaoh has dreams, a couple of a couple of bad dreams. In Genesis 41, you want to read verses 1 through 7 for us? Sure. It says, when two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing by the Nile when out of the river there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows, ugly and gaunt, came up out of the Nile and stood beside those on the riverbank. And the cows that were ugly and gaunt ate up the seven sleek, fat cows. Sounds terrifying, doesn't it? Then Pharaoh woke up. He fell asleep again and had a second dream. 
Seven heads of grain, healthy and good, were growing up on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads of grain sprouted thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven healthy full heads, and then Pharaoh woke up. It had been a dream. So the Nile River is pretty important in mm -hmm. Egypt, and well, in some say the greatest river in the world. Um, it's the only river in Egypt. It's well over 1,600 miles long. It's the longest river in the world. Also it makes it kind of different the fact that it flows north. Mm -hmm. Kind of makes it work kind of different. You know, it, it flows in a different direction. Uh, but out of the Nile comes seven sleek and fat cows and they're grazing. Out of the same river come seven ugly and gaunt cows and stand beside the fat, sleek cows and they eat them up. Same thing happens with the grain. So he tries to figure out, okay, what could this mean? Yeah, it's got his attention. Yeah. yeah. Nile River, cows, grain. Right. All these things right. are very important to Egypt. Absolutely. Um, verse 8, in the morning his mind was troubled, and so he sent out for all the magicians and the wise men of Egypt. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret them for him. You know, I guess to their credit, uh, you know, I, I guess the temptation would have been maybe to make something up. Um, but they basically say, I don't have a clue. Um, or, we don't have a clue um, as to what these dreams mean. And, but you have to believe that God, God has been working in Joseph's life in his dreams, through his dreams, and, and, and being able to interpret the dreams. Um, we have to also believe that God is also working in Pharaoh's life with the two dreams that he has here, that God is responsible for planning these dreams in, in Pharaoh's sleep. And this Pharaoh does not respond the same way, of course, that the Pharaoh mm -hmm. in the story of Moses responds, right? That is correct. Um, so, I guess we pick up in verse 9. Verse 9. Um, then the, the cupbearer said to Pharaoh, Today I'm reminded of my shortcomings. Pharaoh was once angry with his servants, and he imprisoned me in the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream. And things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position, and the other man was impaled. <laughs> so so Joe Pharaoh <laughs> sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. I kind of wonder, I mean, what, what did Joseph look like yeah. being in prison uh, for two years, not having bathed or shaved? shaved. Right. Maybe something like this right here. Wow. Something like that, maybe? Could be. Yeah, that's, that's could be <laughs> remarkable. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so he's cleaned up. He's cleaned up. He cleans up. But now, you know, it's kind of, kind of hard for us to understand how, I mean, this is a big deal to be hauled in front of the Pharaoh because the Pharaoh, the Egyptians looked at him as God, basically. He, he, I mean, they kind of looked at him as, I mean, he was kind of the embodiment of God. So, I mean, yeah, you want to yeah. you look your best. So um, he comes to meet him, and uh, in verses 15 and 16, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream. And no one can inter and interpret it. But I have heard it said of you, when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Uh, I cannot do it, Joseph replied mm. to Pharaoh. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. That says a lot about Joseph. It does. Yeah. Um, Pharaoh says, according to my sources, you're the guy. And he quickly deflects and says, no, I'm not the guy God is. Right. God is the one who's able to. Um, to interpret so he you know to joseph's credit he gives he gives god um he starts with god um and that's how uh that's how he answers and so it was a big moment uh, kind of his uh, golden opportunity to uh play the victim card here but um you know he doesn't he doesn't bring he doesn't bring the cupbearer out doesn't expose him for leaving him in the dungeon for two years uh i mean to joseph's credit you know, he just moves, marches forward, uh -huh. and um, and brings God, you know, to the to the front. Right, which is a lot different than his response when he was seventeen. 
Yeah, and maybe the maybe the humility that we see in Joseph right now is uh, again the result of being in prison for two years, that God is humbling him. What we find interesting as we've looked at the character of Joseph is um, that um, you know from age uh, thirty he's going he's thirty years old to to one hundred and ten, um, not one single word of resentment comes out of his heart. There's nothing that um, he says about Potiphar's wife um, that's negative. There's nothing neg negative said about um, the, uh, the way he was done by his brothers. Not a word of bitterness um, toward anyone, which is very unusual um, unusual for him. And, um, and so he doesn't take the position of, of revenge, but... Uh, but he takes the high road every time. So Pharaoh gives him the, these dreams and, and then waits for an answer as to how they're, how they're going to be interpreted. And so picking up in verse 25 through 32, Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to you, Pharaoh, what he's about to do. The seven good cows are seven years and the seven good heads of grain are seven years. It's one and the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that come up afterward are seven years, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind. There are seven years of famine. It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. And all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten, and the famine wow. will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered, because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do it soon. And so both both the dreams are talking about the same thing. Right. Um, and what jumps out in this passage here is how many times God is mentioned. Joseph is just mentioning, you know, God. God you has know, shown and, you. And every, right, and, right. You know, but Egypt is going to have seven years of abundance followed by seven years of famine. And the seven years of famine will be so severe that they will have forgotten the seven years of abundance. And um, so that's pretty, in, pretty intense famine. Um, then he adds his counsel in verse 33, and now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. And what we find very interesting when we're reading this is that, uh, you know, Joseph doesn't volunteer himself. Right. This is 30 year, 30 year old Joseph, not 17 year old Joseph. And so, you know, he's, he's learned, he's learned, he's grown um, a lot from those days. And so, um, you know, he's going to be asking for 20%, 20% of, uh, of the grain. But, uh, and someone needs to be in charge of this. Uh, right. But uh, he's, he's not promoting himself at all. He's just giving wise counsel to Pharaoh. And from what I read too, that uh, Pharaoh had a tax of 10%. So actually he's demanding 20% doubling. Is, mm -hmm. is doubling that and saying, you know, you got to really prepare for this. So, uh, yeah, you don't promote. There's no self promotion here. Nope. But in so doing, in humbling himself, he gets that promotion. Yes, he does. So, picking up with verse 41, uh, going to 43. Jo so Pharaoh said to Joseph, "I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt." So this is Pharaoh saying to this Hebrew, who was in pr his own his prison. prison, saying, "I'm going to give you the whole land of Egypt." He was in prison a few days ago. Right. Just, just <laughs> gives get right out of prison. Right. Right. And not only that, but he gives him his signet ring from his finger and puts it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen, put a gold chain around his neck, like something you'd do. Yeah. He had him ride in a chariot <laughs> as his second in command, and people shouted before him, make way. Thus, he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. And this wow. is at the age of 30. 30 years old. Um, kind of unbelievable. It really is hard for some people to read this story and to believe it. Um, a lot of folks struggle with this rags to riches story. I mean, you know, clearly it's the work of God, but uh, I mean, it is remarkable that, uh, that the Pharaoh who puts this person who is fresh out of prison, who had been thrown in prison because he supposedly approached you know, a nobleman's wife and uh, you know, and he becomes basically second in command of Pharaoh. 
Yeah, maybe the cupbearer had some credibility um, recommending him. That went a long way yeah. in Pharaoh's mind, but um, it's obviously the hand of God at work here. In in the dream and the dreams that he plants in Pharaoh, and then for you know for Joseph to to be able to interpret those spot on with such confidence and ease, while the wisest magicians were right. stumped by it. And it's significant that he was thirty years old, because who else was thirty years old? We're talking about Jesus. last, yeah, last week. We're talking about some of the, yeah, the, the connections, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, waiting has its rewards. Yeah. So, a few takeaways, uh, you know, and I have a couple, and then maybe you can you can share um, some of your takeaways as well. But during waiting periods, trust God without panic. I think that all of us in life are going to experience being abandoned. We're all going to have cupbearers who are going to forget about us and make promises and break them. Um, and our job is to be faithful to God. Joseph is a good example of this, of someone that just continues to be faithful to God and doesn't abandon God in the waiting, in the waiting periods. We see this happening a lot when, when we're called to suffer or we're called to, to wait, um, is to throw in the towel and to give up. Not the time to do that. God does His greatest work um, deep within us during these during these periods of, of waiting. Another takeaway is when the reward comes, thank God without pride. Um, I know that a lot a lot of us um, feel like we don't deserve where we're at, the positions that we hold in life. And um, and maybe we're a little hard on ourselves, but uh, you know, again, Joseph goes from from nothing to second in command in Egypt, but it's all the, the hand and the work of God here. And so there's a reason you are in the place that you're at. And that is uh, God's placed you there. And so be in that place with confidence, knowing that you wouldn't be there if God hadn't placed you there. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, and the third takeaway that I have is just this idea of forgiveness, which is um, what, what Joseph does. He forgives Potiphar's wife. He forgives the butler. Um, and, uh, you know, if... Uh, you know, we read later in the story that his one of his sons, he has a couple of sons, um, Ephraim and then Manasseh. But Manasseh's, um, the name Manasseh means I'm going to forget. I'm going to forget um, what has happened to me. I'm going to forget about it. And that's what Joseph um, does is just forgets the, the things that have gone wrong in his life, um, puts, it, puts it behind him. He, but he's, but he's learned from them. Mm -hmm. He's learned from those. He's not forgotten what he's learned from those. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think although there's a couple of things, um, even though others may recognize God's presence in your life and the special talents that you have, you don't have to broadcast it. Hmm. Um, and again, it's about humility. That's um, something we're sadly lacking in our society. Yeah. But uh, humility, you know, uh, being humble. Uh, also, that um, this is a reference to uh, uh, Ephesians 3.20, but believe that what you will do not only benefit those whom you see and meet, but also that your work has the potential to touch lives for many generations to come. God is able to accomplish a lot more than we think than we can ever ask or imagine. And a lot of times, you know, not to make too much of it, but a lot of times, little things we do day in and day out, you may not realize it at the time what they meant to someone, but in God's plan and through God's blessing can work yeah. things you never imagined. You know, and uh, just like teaching, you know, you never realize that, you know, in the classroom, what you may say to someone or even outside the classroom, how that, you know, years later that may have meant something to someone that you, that you, that you didn't realize at the time. Yeah, how you made a person feel. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Those you, ones. Yeah. Um, and I, I can think of several instances in, in, in my brief career as a teacher that uh, that, that has come to. I mean, uh, yeah, that that's that's made it all worthwhile. That's made it. You know, I see God working. Good stuff. So a broken and contrite heart isn't the end. Right. It could be the very beginning. Of, of We're being what, shaped. Uh, mm. And so Joseph, at the age of 30, he comes across as a man with great stability, deeper quality, and profound character. And I think we have maybe one more 
study. And, uh, and now he's got lots of power. We'll have one more where he faces his brothers and, and how all that goes down. And we'll do that uh, next week. Um, anything else comes, come to mind before we, we wrap up? No, we're still, we still, we still circled Elijah and the, the two bears. Right? Well, yeah, work that uh, in that, somehow. we got to work that in. Uh, I think that's a common theme that needs to be throughout, throughout this whole study. Uh, because that is an amazing story. But, uh, again, there's a, there's a lot to be learned about. You don't make fun of a bald head. And there it is in scripture. It's right there in scripture. I always enjoy doing this with you, Bill. Yeah, Thank well. you for, for joining me. And uh, let's wrap up with a word of prayer. And so, Father, we uh, thank you for Genesis 41. Um, when we wait, um, do a work in us that um, we can be ready to move for you um, when the time is right. Rid our hearts of pettiness and fill our hearts with your love. And like Joseph, help us to be quick to forgive and, um, and to marvel that when we do that, what you're able to do in our lives, shaping us and making us men and women of character. Father, I just want to lift up our church to you um, in the middle of this uh, COVID-19 season that we find ourselves in. Let's pray for protection over all of our membership, over all of our community, this whole world. Um, we pray, Father, for, for an answer. But I do pray for the Trace family, Lord, that uh, you'd watch over us and um, strengthen us as we spend time um, tonight in your word. Um, we miss uh, being able to come together like we have been in the past, but uh, you're still on the throne and we acknowledge that. Thank you for my partner, Bill and Ryan, that does all the, the work for us to, to get this uh, produced and, and out there. And just uh, uh, bless us, Lord, to have a good week serving you. This is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.